The Socialism Conference is more than anything else a place to exchange ideas for activism and for fighting for a better world. I mean, it's like nothing else on the U.S. left and it's why I come to it every year. My first time at the Socialism Conference, so far it is one of the most interesting left conferences I've ever attended and I have attended a lot of left-wing conferences. It's very energizing, it's, it's very eclectic, people are very engaging and, uh, and warm. It's really kind of a homecoming, but it's certainly a place to be challenged and it's certainly a place to, to grapple with ideas. So yeah, folks should definitely come. Right now in the United States, there's very little attention and discussion of foreign policy and other parts of the world and the mainstream media. And I feel like the Socialism Conference helps network me in to things that I don't always have access to. It's an annual affair. I've been attending many of them. And I get a lot of energy from meeting new people and meeting older people that have been here. So it's very stimulating. It's very thought provoking. And it also shows that there is a community that believes in collective action. There are very few places and very few times that you can get this kind of exposure, this kind of broad exposure to what's going on, and that you can learn so much in one place, but also that you can build so much capacity on your own to be able to take this home and get things done. I think it's a really great conference if, if you're trying to either get up to speed on where socialism's at in, in the U.S. and more broadly, or if you're an experienced organizer and you want to sort of like connect, recharge your batteries, really learn what other people are thinking about, this is a really a great place to be. I really am overwhelmed by the amount of new people who are here, and I think they're really ready to step up, and so I'll definitely be at Socialism Conference. I don't understand how we can ultimately dismantle any of it if we don't stick to a to a, you know, intensely radical politics. You're not broke if you're taxing rich people. We break production for profit and we replace it by production for need. This event is brought to you by Haymarket Books. Now more than ever, it is critical to support independent publishers, independent bookstores, and independent voices. There are two ways you can do this today. First, by buying books from Haymarket at haymarketbooks.org. And secondly, by joining the Haymarket Book Club. The following event will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the channel, like this video now, and share it with as many people as possible. If you like this event, be sure to catch these upcoming events in Haymarket's live stream series. You can register for these upcoming events Haymarket Books Eventbrite page. If you miss an event, you can listen to the recording afterward by subscribing to our podcast, Haymarket Live, wherever you get your podcasts. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. We are moderating the chat, but we cannot guarantee that everyone will observe our community guidelines. People who violate these guidelines will have their comments deleted as quickly as we are able. This event will have live closed captions. Instructions for accessing the captions will be posted in the chat. We should have time for Q&A.
so please post your questions in the YouTube chat window, and we'll get to those later in the program. Thanks for joining us today. Our event will begin shortly. That always happens. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to No More Exclusions, Haymarket Burke, Burks and Hadra Press, three part online political education series, bringing together radical voices from the UK and international community to develop an abolitionist vision of education. My name is Sarah Baffo. I'm one of the organizers of No More Exclusions, a black led anti racist movement working towards building an abolitionist grassroots movement in education and working towards ending exclusions in all schools. I feel honored to be chairing today's event and sharing a space with such phenomenal people, including everyone watching. The purpose of this three part political education series is to explore abolitionist ideas beyond the UK and US, where we're actively and consciously shifting the imperial lens in our reimagination process. As the great Tony Morrison once said, I tell my students when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. And if you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. And that has been the very essence of No More Exclusions work and all the speakers here today. I started organizing with No More Exclusions at a stage where any sense of radical hope was being eradicated. So that was completely changed the moment I started organizing with communities such as No More Exclusions. And there was an urge to transform each other's lives and others. I hope you get to experience this one way, either today or throughout the three-part political education series. We are all on a journey to learn with and for each other. We, can't, we become radicalized and politicized in different stages of our lives. And the very purpose of this space is to explore, re-explore re ideas as we're working towards destroying racial capitalism. We also know that due to this being an online event, we might have cops um, watching, we ha might have other people using this session as a form of surveillance. So it's important to acknowledge and be aware of this. So that is it for me today. I will pass it on to Zava, and I would like to welcome Zava, a recovering teacher, organizer with no more exclusions, and just a phenomenal activist and person to be around. I'll pass it on to her so she can kickstart this, this amazing session. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, Haymarket, Haja Press, and everyone that's um, watching and listening or that will be watching and listening. Um, so I've been tasked with the uh, great responsibility of introducing enemy for anyone who uh, may not have heard of, of, of this collective um, and explaining a little bit how um, the organizing started and why and purpose, so which is really important. So, no more exclusions is, is just under um, through four years old now, so still very young as a collective movement. Um, we wanted to, um, I suppose, when I say we, it really started with uh, an, a sense of real anger as an educator. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to situate that anger in myself um, and then kind of reaching out to people around me to see if any, anyone else was feeling that anger, that deep sense of rage um, at the way things were working out in education. Uh, back in 2018, I was working in um, a London school for children and young people um, who, are, who have been excluded, who have been expelled. Um, from school, and um, they uh, they they were predominantly black and brown students. They um, many of them were um, kind of put on the register uh, as disabled, and the label here in England is sent special education on needs and disabilities, um, and and that kind of like um, helped. I felt the school, the setting, kind of. Uh, maintain kind of small class sizes and uh, but really didn't really um, kind of the, the, the money didn't really follow the young people and their needs weren't really identified and well defined so it was this nebulous send label that was attached to them so mainly black and brown mainly given this label send and then um, um, nearly all of them um, um, I, I would say um, 
really socially economically disadvantaged as an expression i don't like saying but it's it's the way they are described and, and categorized in in um, in education and again extra funding attached to that this is why i'm mentioning these things um but really we didn't really see um the the fruits of all this extra funding in in, in many ways in some ways we did so yes the class sizes were smaller um but the school building really resembled prison um there were no there was no gym uh there's no science lab there was no drama studio there was no music space uh the young people weren't allowed to they were as young as um 10 and 11 not allowed out at the time i was there for 10 years not allowed out during break time the lunch time was reduced down to half an hour um really to make it easier for the staff that worked there to manage um there was cctv camera um, in every space the students were accompanied to and from the toilets which we kept locked at all times um the first requirement of any member of staff joining that setting um was to be trained in how to restrain physically restrain um and, and obtain a certificate in that um and a willingness to carry out restraints um and um children and young people as i said as young as 10 and 11 would be searched on arrival um they would have to hand over all their belongings they wouldn't be allowed to carry a bag or a mobile phone or anything books nothing and the school building and that those were really the conditions um and, and i'm just describing part of it the conditions under which um yeah i worked for 10 years and in the beginning of that um i thought uh that was doing some good work i thought i was helping like a lot of educators uh feel and say and think a lot of the time and it was only really over time that i started to question it and it took a long time because you as an educator you are often your identity is deeply invested in the work that you do um and it is difficult to kind of do self-reflection it's really difficult to kind of say is what I'm doing um, really good? <laughs> Am I a good person? These are difficult questions. And I know that a lot of people that are, do vocational work, that do work that isn't necessarily well-paid, caring professions and so on, uh, struggle, struggle with questioning the very essence of, of, of you know, what they've dedicated so many years of study and time and love and care. Uh, so that was a process that happened over time. Um, the realization that actually we weren't doing good in this setting. Actually, the curriculum was really restricted. Actually, we were lying to the children and young people. We were saying to them, um, of course you can achieve the same as everyone else. You just have to work hard. Of course you can do your exams here in, in, in England, the GCSE exams at uh, age 16, same as everyone else, and not providing them uh, with the resources and not providing with the adequate teaching. A lot of them had spent time outside of education had immense gaps right in the in a uh, through no fault of their own and um and, and still we're churning out these lies so i suppose part part of the catalyst that led to NME is is a refusal to per perpetuate these lies in education that the work that we do is always uh going to produce is, because it's got good intentions comes from a good place it will lead to good outcomes that is something that we really have to um say no to no more to i think is one of the things we have to say no more to the second thing i think um that kind of brought us to NME was the fact that the teachers that were there at the pupil referral unit, as it's called, uh, were being made redundant around that time, around 2018. That included myself. And, and so there was a real sense of us suddenly being made disposals, us suddenly feeling like we're no longer needed or required. We are surplus to requirement. And I think that was another radicalizing moment, you know, um, a moment in which we could, I suppose, and we should have should have had to come to that, but we could start to feel. I certainly did start to feel maybe a fraction of how the children and young people in our care feel and have been feeling, right? And 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 then the the third and final thing, which is why education is so important, was the fact that I had the opportunity to study, uh, which I think teachers should be doing all of the time. I don't think that teacher education as it stands at the moment is adequate, in fact, it's the opposite and it's by design trying to de-skill and de-professionalize and take away like critical uh, reflection and critical thinking skills away from teachers. Um, 
but I had the opportunity to study to do a master's in social justice and education. And I think that was really the first time where I had theory, I had the language uh, and I, to, to really start to excavate all of the things that um, really I should have been, um, I should have, I, I should have I should have had the opportunity to do it before, um, I would say. So I have I have a lot of anger and regret in relation to how many years, really, uh, it took me to come to the realization that the work that happens in these spaces, that have, that have, even the work that happens in mainstream, um, can actually produce and reproduce so much harm, um, social exclusion, and, uh, and actual pain. Um, the title of this series uh, we've come up with deconstruction, uh, refusal, and um, and departure. I just want to say a few words about that and then pass on to Lola. So deconstruction, I want to shout out the Construire, which is a education collective, Black feminist education collective in Rennes in France. That's really the inspiration behind that word. I think many words have been co-opted and taken away from us um, or overused and kind of lose meaning over time. Deconstructing, for us in this context of these conversations means examining, uh, taking apart, in order to reveal the basis, the composition, the intention behind that, that will expose the biases, flaws and consistencies of a system uh, and institutions. Um, also for us deconstructing in this context means, is there anything at all that we can, once we have taken apart the components of the system, is there anything at all that we can save? anything at all and how can we save any of it in in radical but in radical new way reimagine it and finally what elements of it of the of, of um of the system in our case the education system need to just go and need to be destroyed and demolished um and and that's really where that word deconstruction comes from and this is how i personally interpret it in this context um in education what needs to um to be deconstructed well there's so much we have the curriculum we have hierarchies so many uh forms of oppression um that are unaddressed and talked about teachers still don't have the language to talk about um the lived experience that that the children in their care have right they the, the inequalities that have been accelerated and exacerbated throughout this period uh, over the last two or three years um Many educators have, 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 in my view, have have not been equipped or they haven't equipped themselves also with the language and, and sometimes even the attitude um, to to even begin to to unpick. And I wonder whether um, there there is an unwillingness, right? And that's part partly what has to be deconstructed: that unwillingness um, to 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 really be able to look at the dark. Um, the dark side of education. What are the forms of oppression? What is the harm? What is the um, social? What are the social injustices that, that we are responsible for reproducing? Not solely as education is part of a wider system, societal system, but what are we responsible for? And not, and really power, you know. Um, and in terms of refusal, um, well, the name "No More Exclusions" is a statement of refusal, uh, and it is radical. I personally made the decision that I wouldn't be in a classroom uh, for as long as I am required to restrain young people. I am required to be more like a prison guard than an educator. That discipline and control, which is what the policy context and practice in England is all about at the moment, no excuses, um, uh, zero tolerance, uh, is all about. That I, 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 I will not be an enabler of that, but I realize that that's not necessarily something that all educators can or should do. That, but that that is the place I'm coming from, uh, but not as a way of abandoning education, because education really needs us uh, as much as we need it, and um, as a way of um, as a way of kind of saying we can we education needs all of us from multiple points of entry and multiple points of departure. So um, I want to stop with and finish with um, a poem that was given to me the last time I was in a classroom by one of the students. And this was actually in the mainstream school. And actually what is called quote unquote high achieving school. Um, student, students there uh, had Googled no more exclusions and kind of worked out the work that I do outside of the classroom and just gave me this piece of paper. And the student that wrote this 
uh, their name is Tony Ann Thompson. Uh, hopefully she's on the call and might be able to speak later. The, the title is Constant Double Standards. The education system here is a walking contradiction. Teachers abuse their power over students using fear as a tool of superiority. The people who are our only form of protection five days a week are the ones we fear the most. We are constantly reminded that as individuals, we must be unique and apologetic for being ourselves, yet they will, they will go to extraordinary lengths to strip away our individuality, to make us mindless robots. Just another statistics for the school to sell to another unexpected parent. We are left to fend for ourselves and bond over our psychological trauma and misfortune. This school is a dictatorship. What they say goes. Questioning the authority or defending ourselves is deemed as defiance and offence, which can result in solitary confinement. When we say this is a prison, we say it without a single bit of irony. We are presented with rights, false promises, accompanied by a corrupt jurisdiction who set the rules without a thought towards the people who have to follow them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zara, um, for all your work, for the, your words you've shared with everyone today. I think you said something really important about the act of refusal and also actively and consciously rebuilding, um, because dismantling the schooling system is a form of survival force. Um, and the work of normal exclusion does that. It centers the voice of people who normally have been disposed by the education system and the institution. So thank you so much. I'm like virtually clapping. Um, but for now, I'll pass it on to Lola. Hopefully people are thinking about their questions and sharing it in the chat. So I would like to introduce Lola, a black feminist writer, a Cream Stewart Hall Foundation researcher from London, author of Experiment in Imagining Otherwise. Again, just an overall inspirational writer, activist, and someone who inspires a lot of people. Um, so I'll pass on to you. Thank you so much. It's um, yeah, so wonderful to be sharing um, space with all of you and Zara. I feel like um, the things that you said really make me remember that children are able to, you know, name the violence that happens to them. And I think that that's an important starting point um, for thinking through like abolitionist th uh, thought just in general. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, I guess a problem of sexual violence and I think abolitionists and um, people who want to enact radical approaches to education and learning are often tasked with defending themselves against kind of uh, willful misreadings of their political projects and in the case of NME in the UK and um, and the question of sexual violence we've seen those invested in carceral systems levy the claim that abolitionists those people seeking to treat all human life as if it were precious are willing to condone sexual violence occurring between school children because they're opposed to exclusion. I think it's important to address that misreading, um, if only to help us get closer to what an abolitionist vision of education can offer us. Um, and this kind of misreading is intended, I think, to do two things. I think it's um, intended, one, to um, kind of scaremonger by appealing to um, its audience's worst fears that sexual violence could happen to children and go unchallenged. And I think, two, it's intended to kind of paint abolitionists out as abstract utopians um, who have no serious answers to the questions at hand. And I think abolitionists take the question of violence so seriously that they're actually prepared to question the false promises um, of protection that carcerality offers. And in the case of children, we see how appeals um, for protection, for the protection of um, children via exclusions, quickly override the deeper and more critical questions that we have to ask ourselves um, about why sexual violence is so pervasive in the world we live in and how we can end it. Um, I think the principles of abolition hold that it might be possible to address harm without uh, banishment, confinement, sectioning, exclusion. They hold that it's our duty to build the economic, social, political conditions, that allow human beings to flourish and grow and experience dignified existence, um, that give them back the ability to think about violence without retribution. And I think ab abolitionists understand um, that education to be a kind of active reciprocal process that should give people the tools to um, understand not only what is happening 
to them um, in the context that they're in, um, but also enable them to access um, the resources they need in order to live well. And abolitionists believe it's possible to build, protect and extend, you know, cultures and systems of organization and spaces where violence is not an inevitability and where when it does occur, the root causes of that violence are properly addressed. So as to lessen the chances of its reoccurrence. I think with the problem of um, the, the problem of sexual violence isn't one that's confined to school. As feminists, we know that it pervades all aspects of our lives, that capitalism, the state and other modes of social organization via institutions are organized in ways that expose us to the threat of sexual violence wherever we are. Um, and to understand why sexual violence is so pervasive, we have to understand systems of power, I think. For example, capitalism works so that women in precarious work don't often have the tools or resources to report instances of sexual violence in the workplace because they fear losing their jobs. The border works so that those with insecure immigration status won't go to the police if they experience sexual violence um, because they fear being deported, not that they should anyway. Carcerality works so women in prison are experiencing sexual violence violence at unprecedented rates and there are little to no systems of um, support to ensure their survival. So abolitionists hold that those systems of power, um, they have an impact on our actions, the way we move and express ourselves, I guess, in the world. Um, the logics that might lead to interpersonal harm in, in the case of sexual violence, I think, begin quite early. So if we refuse to essentialize violence into the bodies of those who commit harm, we can argue that exposure to violence from a young age, the rigidity of the gender binary and the social norms attached to it, heteronormativity, cultures of shame, poverty, lack of information regarding um, healthy sexual expression for school-aged children um, are some of the things that might contribute to the prevalence of sexual violence in schools. That disciplinary aspect of gender embeds logics um, in our society about the role of women, men, boys and girls that contribute to a culture where social relations are defined by ideas of domination and subordination. I think abolitionists take the effect of these systems um, on our minds and bodies seriously, understanding that it's only the abolition of these systems of power that might free up um, space for us to continue to build and imagine new forms of social relation. I think the idea that it's exclusion that protects young girls from forms of sexual violence is ludicrous when we recognize that they al already live in a society that exposes them to inordinate amounts of harm. We know that black children are already being regularly strip searched a form of sexual violence by policing agencies. And um, we know that police already maintain a presence um, uh, in schools across the country, traumatizing children at their most formative years. Exclusion doesn't prevent sexual violence in the home or the nuclear family, the place where it is most most likely to occur or on the street or you know when children have their Saturday jobs it doesn't stop lewd comments made by harassers on the school bus stalking that might occur as school age um, children grow into women or it, it won't stop the police officer who uses his police power to apprehend and then murder a woman. Exclusion does not tackle, I think, an environment where young girls are forced to become kind of inward, afraid, self-critical as a result of experiencing forms of sexual violence. And if we take seriously the need for safety, exclusion is not the thing that will keep young girls safe in a world that's organized to keep them unsafe. Only changing the conditions of that world can do that. And in the meantime, refusing to reaffirm the myth that um, they are safe or even questioning the notion of what safety means in this society because somebody else has been banished. I think as feminists, we also need to be aware of the legacy of a specific kind of feminist analysis of sexual violence in the West um, that sees men and by extension young boys as inherent agents of harm. We see how liberal feminism has also been wielded in service of propping up the prison by advancing the argument that exclusion and other forms of carcerality are necessary for the protection of women and girls. Here we see how a kind of revolutionary ideology is manipulated in service of biological essentialism 
socialism, if young boys are inherently predatory and dangerous, if we understand that it's impossible to disrupt or prevent uh, violent patterns of behavior, then exclusion becomes the only solution. If masculinity is an exceptional site of harm and femininity is an exceptional site of injury, then we see the way that protecting young women and girls can be wielded in defense of transphobia, in defense of uh, continued existence of prisons, police, and other kind of carceral mechanisms. So the liberal feminist mantra of protecting young girls um, becomes less about dismantling, abolishing, or challenging the systems, um, patterns, and modes of social organization that put them at risk, and more about creating a fictive wrongdoer that has to be stopped. The existence of the wrongdoer is what justifies the existence of the prison and all the carceral systems that prop that up. I think abolition asks us to consider that it's possible to prevent violence from occurring, not just punishing it once it has happened. Understanding um, the kind of prevalence and complexity, I think, of sexual violence on a theoretical level might properly help us understand the patterns of violence that we see occurring across our schools. So in the UK, if 59% of young girls um, and young women aged 13 to 21 said that uh, said that they have faced some form of sexual harassment at school or in college in a single year, then it's clear that um, we live in conditions that are allowing the perpetuation of that violence, whether or not an individual uh, students are excluded. Exclusion is not um, only, I think, an inadequate way to address this problem. It actively contributes to its continuation. I think exclusion is not only wrong because it cannot address the problem. It's carceral because it locates the problem in the body of um, the, the supposed wrongdoer and holds that their expulsion will lessen the frequency and severity of the problem, reaffirming kind of notions of men's inherent violent nature via their removal I think, from our communities is not how we will end sexual violence. And the racialized nature of this thinking disproportionately positions young black men as agents of harm, crim uh, criminality, and puts them um, in danger of surveillance, arrest, um, multiple forms of brutality. So the logic um, it, it, is a myth, I think, designed to justify, protect, and fortify the prison. And if the link between exclusion and the prison is not already obvious, we only have to look at the statistics that tell us that um, uh, those in prison are more likely to have been excluded from school, have experiences in the care system, have special educational needs. They, like survivors, are being failed. And exclusion merely protects the idea that they, there are fundamentally bad or harmful children who are defined by patterns of harmful behavior and can only be engaged using that logic. The kind of bad disruptive child becomes the wayward teenager, then becomes the prisoner who deserves to be imprisoned. I think abolitionists are concerned with understanding sexual violence occurring between um, school aged children in a global context of a classed, racialized society where the state acts as the arbiter of power between those who who own the means of production and those who don't. Um, and I want to end, I guess, with a kind of alternative vision that, that refuses these carceral logics. And this vision isn't total, it's you know necessarily incomplete, um, but I guess imagine this, a working class um, school child experiences a form of sexual violence and or assault by a peer. And because there is an environment that encourages openness with regard to sexuality, a firm understanding of bodily autonomy and the harmful impact of gender on everyone, immediately that child feels comfortable and able to disclose this to an adult or another peer and is able to properly express the extent of the harm caused. So whilst they're receiving aftercare that is specifically suited to the experience experience that they've had, they are asked what accountability would look like for them. But this question of accountability from, caregiv uh, from caregivers is not premised on uh, the punishment of the person who has caused the harm. They do not assume that banishing the person who has committed harm will lessen the severity of the bodily invasion that this child has experienced. Accountability might look like reasonable adjustments for their learning whilst this child processes what has happened to them, access to support groups and the money to help their parents with childcare in order that more focus can be placed on their recovery, enabling this child to, um, to kind of access holistic forms of care, including therapeutic services, placing them in community with other children who have experienced forms of sexual violence, a commitment to an ongoing care plan by all teachers and caregivers that takes into account the impact of this violence on their development. And the child who has committed harm instead of permanent exclusion has access to resources that help caregivers understand the driving forces behind their 
interactions. Instead of being isolated from their peers, one-to-one -one supervision is incorporated into a kind of bespoke learning plan, as well as um, the creation of guidance, which takes into account their specific needs. This child is encouraged to express themselves through creative means. The school provides guidance and, re and resources that look into the environment, culture, and institutional oversight that has allowed this violence to take um, to take place and think about how it might be prevented in future. Radical, anti-capitalist, comprehensive sex and relationship education is incorporated into schooling. They have access to support groups, teaching assistance, mentoring, and a robust accountability process that enables them to fully reckon with the harm um, that they have caused in a safe and supportive environment. Their material needs are fully addressed by their community. Their family are provided with support by community members. A plan is put in place by school governors, teachers, that enables both students to remain members of the school community whilst taking into account the specific needs of both parties. Um, these children are able to kind of continue their education. Um, but that was just a kind of, you know, thought experiment. And I guess I'll end there. Wow, thank you so much for all of those points. And I think you remind all of us, um, I can speak for myself, that like abolition isn't just a theoretical ideology, like it's very much possible. Um, young people ask to be materially supported by community. I will hold back for my questions because I have so many after all of your amazing points. Um, I would like to introduce, last but definitely not least, um, Kelsey, who will be representing Cradle Community, a collective group experiment with how we build transformative justice, community accountability in our communities. Cradle Community also released a book called Brick by Brick, How We Build a World Without Prisons, which I can say has been in influential in my own politics and organizing. So I'll pass on to Kelsey to, to share. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and firstly, thank you so much, Haymarket and Haja and NME for inviting Cradle to be part of this conversation. Um, and of course, always just extra thanks to Haja for uh, publishing our work brick by brick and for supporting us. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for, for hosting tonight and it's always obviously a, a total a real honor to to hear Lola and Zara speak um yeah I'm here to speak a little bit about um British imperialism and the impact that it's had on on education in a sort of more global sense or uh in terms of my experience of of uh having been educated in the global south for some of my life um a bit about Cradle's work um, in yeah trying to create transformed education and learning spaces. Um, so yeah, like I said, so my family is from Guyana. I was um, uh, yeah went to school there for a few years, and both my parents were educated there, and so that's kind of like the context I'm most familiar with. And it was a former British colony. Um, and I feel like it really uh, is a really like a, a, yeah, an important example for me in terms of the ways that the British Empire like still lives on through the education system um, in places like the Caribbean. So uh, yeah, the British the education system from Britain was obviously exported all over the world and still stands as. Uh, like kind of is considered as like the the standard of education globally and there's still very much this idea within the Caribbean of like if you can it's like the the best opportunities are if you go and be educated in the UK or in the US um, and that education system like is mirrored within within the Caribbean so we still have like highly punitive structures all of the like best uh, schools are ones that are named after um, like British schools basically and were like historically run by British teachers. Often they were things like convent schools and so there's obviously a, a religious aspect to, to that as well. But I really think that this history is so important and it's so important to situate ourselves within that history because uh, after the abolition of slavery, obviously that education system has continued to be enforced. And even after many of the colonies gained independence, 
uh, still there's this striving to compete with the British education system. And even while things change and laws and things change within the British system, so things like corporal punishment, that may have been uh, banned in the UK in the 80s, although as we know in lots of education systems there definitely are physical forms of, of punishment and restraint and things that Zara spoke of. Um, but in places like Guyana, like that's still not against the law. And so that, I feel like that is mirrored with lots of laws that the British brought in, particularly ones around gender um, that still uh, exist within Caribbean nations. And so uh, I really want to echo what Lola said in terms of the ways that the education system here really enforces gender and the way that it is continuing to do that in the global south as well. So. Yeah, um, one of the points that when I was speaking to other members of Cradle Community that came up was the fact that also like, yeah, the British education system, that that uh, mythology around it um, drives a lot of immigration towards the UK. And, you know, it's definitely why my family, that was our narrative for why we came back to the UK. Um, and for many of us, and yet it's also considered a punishment for many migrant families where if you are considered a bad kid, then you might be sent back to the Caribbean or back to Nigeria um, in order to go to school there. And that is considered a punishment when actually lots of us have experienced those education systems and actually found that growing up within our communities and these kinds of things, there's obviously like pros to that, but it's often framed as, as this punishment. Um, and so, yeah, um, because we're constantly trying to imitate that British system, there are these like legacies that live on through the ways that we're educated in the in the global south and particularly in the Caribbean. So you have to pass maths and English in order to pass high school. But obviously, English isn't actually the language that most people speak. Most people are, are speaking Creole. And so a lot of people are held back and considered, you know, just like held back from jobs, held back from their education because they aren't able to, they're not as fluent in writing within standard English, but that's not actually the, the language that, that people are primarily using. And so that colonial hangover is, is still there and that still uh, aspiration towards Britishness as like a class status, um, just like really, really exists in, in that space. Um, and I really, I think it's such a, I, yeah, it's in terms of enforcing white supremacy uh, by enforcing and kind of creating this mythology around the British education structures, it means that there's been such a loss of uh, our ancestral knowledges, right? The ways that British, uh, the system that we probably take for granted, but the ways that we divide up subjects, the ways that we move in this competitive way that's very exam focused, all of these things are not obviously pre-colonization, the ways that we probably would have learned. And so we lose so many of those ancestral practices and um, other ways of learning um, because we're, we've been trying to like imitate this system. Um, and so, yeah, and in the same way as it does here, having those very punitive um, systems within the school uh, preps you and lays the groundwork for belief in the idea that exclusion and isolation is how we want to deal with problems, right? And actually within the Caribbean, we know that the the rate of carcerality is actually higher than in other parts of the of the world that actually in places like the UK and the US where there are like more of these reforms, more infrastructures um, of also carceral systems, but not necessarily prisons. It means that within uh, lots of countries in the global south, prison is like the first option for if a crime is, is committed. And so actually the rate of people going to prison is, is very high. And those prisons are of course, the same institutions, but refurbished that the British built in order to incarcerate enslaved populations and indentured peoples. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's really important, I think, to kind of like just situate ourselves within that history. And when we think about ending exclusions in the UK, we want to be connecting with people in the global south and in formerly colonized countries in order to start thinking about how we can work together and build international solidarity to change the ways that we approach learning on like a global scale. Um, so then the other half of what I wanted to speak about was um, Cradle's uh, attempts at experimenting with abolitionist education, with transformative justice, 
Um, obviously, I, yeah, there's been a, a long legacy in the UK of um, particularly black communities finding ways to educate each other about um, and educate their young people about black history, um, particularly in like a church context. I know Akala has written a lot about this, but also um, in the heart of the race, I really recommend people looking at the the legacies of, of uh, black education that are spoken about there and also the experiences of um, black children in schools in the UK. Um, uh, and so there's definitely that legacy of always marginalized communities trying to educate each other, trying to bring in our histories and um, and knowing that that is a key part of resistance. And so uh, I hope that Cradle is able to like follow in that legacy in terms of the ways that we try to work with young people to not just talk about history, but to really also think about what are the skills that we need to develop in order to be different, right? Like what are the ways that we need to be different in order to build this world that we want to see. So how do we build in early skills of how to support each other if some one of your friends is being bullied and how do you how do you support them? How do we uh, learn to listen to each other? How do we learn to build relationships that aren't based in domination and coercion? And how do we do that in spaces even like schools where we're being taught that all the time, right? How do we kind of try and get into those spaces to do that. So we we do a lot of work outside of schools, um, trying to work with young people through like youth groups and things like that, um, and have occasionally managed to get into, into schools to talk about our work. Um, and one of the schools that I really think is a really important and amazing sort of experiment in this is the new school um, in South London, which is a democratically run school, which has no exclusions, works without punishment, and Cradle has been working with the teachers mostly to try and help them reflect on systems of control and punishment that sort of also live in them, right, and the ways that they can develop schools to help facilitate restorative practices within the schools and help the young people, the children, to because it's a primary school, the children to um, yeah, to support each other, to repair relationships when they're when when there's conflict, and to be able to uh, build trust with each other and with the adults as well in a way that means that the young people have agency. They feel that if they speak up, if they speak about their concerns or things that are making them uncomfortable or uh, anything that's happening that they feel like they want to speak about, that they're going to be heard, that something's going to be done about it and it's going to be dealt with in a sensitive way. And so, um, yeah, that has been like a really, I think, fruitful experiment. It's not perfect. Like we come back every year to try and reflect and see like what are the ways that we can do this better. We also don't live, you know, that school does not exist in just a little vacuum. So we're taking in all of these other lessons from other spaces all the time as well. Um, but those are the kinds of things that really give me hope in this work and really trying to think about, you know, what all of the people that work there are people who have left mainstream education because they really wanted to try something new and different and to, you know, hopefully build something that can be replicated elsewhere that with a, with ways that are specific to what the needs are of that community will be. Right. And so I think that's one of the, one of the things that I think I really value. And the other thing I was going to just speak about is, just really thinking about ways that we build in uh, intergenerational learning, right? And through, uh, I think, a really radical approach is one where we understand that we also learn from children, right? We learn from young people um, as adults and we learn from our elders. And throughout our lives, we're going to continue learning and growing. And education isn't just this thing that you do and then you're done. It's actually this thing that, like, forever we need to be, like, learning and reflecting and growing and coming to understand the way the world is changing and all the new perspectives that are constantly um, being developed and things. And I think in, I, yeah, I just believe so deeply in the, the practice of things like facilitation um, because that doesn't, you know, that breaks down that idea that there is just a professional, there is the teacher um, that has the knowledge and then there's the people who don't have the knowledge. It's like we all have knowledge we all have experience we all are able to identify things that are going on around us and put things together and that really is what learning is and so um yeah bringing more of that into all the spaces i think is is really key uh and i'm going to stop there
Thank you so much. Um, I'm just smiling with all of the knowledge in this one virtual room. Um, so many points that you said. Um, and one of the points that I picked up on is acknowledging the work we're doing isn't new. Um, racial capitalism systemically tries, tries to make us forget that the work has been done. We're building the foundations from our ancestors, from past organizations and movements. Um, and that's how we win. Um, and that's incorporating intergenerational conversations. So I want to thank you for reminding everyone. Um, with that, I have a few questions I would love to ask. Um, so hopefully people are asking questions, thinking through their questions, and we can have a fruitful discussion. My first question um, is, what does the act of refusal look like in the everyday? Um, I think when we talk about refusal and when people think about abolition, they think about it in the long run. It's like, we're, we must dismantle racial capitalism. But what does refusal look like every day? Um, so... I'll pass that on to whoever would like to answer. I can go first, or uh, I can attempt. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in, in what Kelsey and Zara have to say about this. But I think for me, um, refusal, I, I think you're right, um, Zara, that when abolitionists put forward a certain vision, um, I think that people's critiques come from a place of fear. They come from a place of um, not really knowing what to do with systems and, and uh, yeah, systems of organization that seem overwhelming, so expansive, so hegemonic. They can't envisage, um, envisage kind of making a break in that. And so their, their inability to conceive of the end of these systems means that they don't ask themselves um, how they could fortify their own kind of daily practices of refusal. And I think for me, refusal is about um, not only non-compliance, but thinking about um, how in in the landscape that you exist in, what kind of interventions you can make and what skills and resources you can give yourself and others, the people that you are in community with, that enables you to make a kind of dent or to make a meaningful intervention in whatever cultural landscape that you're in. And I think like um, Ruthie Gilmore's work on cultural landscapes is so kind of critical here because it it shows us that the cultural landscape is everything. It is the texture of everyday life. It is the street. It is the way the prison is, um, you know, designed to be hidden. It is the way that like detention center is designed to be hidden. And we are, we also take up um, space in those landscapes. We also exist uh, um, amongst a kind of environment of violence. So I think for me, refusal is about asking yourself, how how do I navigate this cultural landscape? And what, um, uh, what kind of powers, I guess, have I given myself to be able to pull um, to, to disrupt um, violence when and um, where I see it, but also to pull others along um, so that they might also be able to um, enact kind of daily um, practices of refusal as well. It's like, you know, like what, what um, won't you do in service of an institution, basically? It's, it's asking that question, you know, how can I be most mischievous, I think, in a way. Love that. Kelsey, Zawa? Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's essentially a, like very similar points to what Lola was was making I think like so many jobs now are like obviously um implicated within the carceral system um through mandatory reporting um things like prevent all of these things and so there's like a very like concrete level of refusal that can happen in terms of just refusing to call the cops right like refusing to engage or like uh prop up carceral systems and the more people who do that the the stronger that response really is, right? Because then it's not just about one person losing their job, but it's actually about, okay, so everybody that's working in this sector is refusing to do this, What now we're gonna have to change something, right? Um, but it's also, I think, yeah, like interrupting that culture of violence that just exists, like the way that street harassment and um, yeah, just like public, humiliation and violence is so normalized for marginalized people to actually break through 
speak to strangers like who are experiencing difficult things in a public space, asking if people are okay, um, finding ways to intervene, building power that like the state essentially like doesn't want us to have, right? Which is that, you know, they want us to be like individualistic. We want us to be very scared of each other. And if we can break through that and really start speaking speaking out for each other and also just like intervening and supporting each other when we see things happening I think all of that like speaks to refusing to engage in a in a culture that otherwise actually says that violence is okay like every time that something is happening in public and we're like oh it's none of my business better 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 carry on and, and go on my way that's actually like sending a message that that, that behavior is okay right and whereas if people who were uh you know, um, taking advantage of that silence who they started being interrupted every single time they tried to harass someone, I believe very strongly that they start thinking, oh, I'm going to have to actually think about what I'm doing now, you know, like, because clearly it's not actually that okay. Everyone kicks off at me every time I do this. And Mm. so, like, yeah, I think it's really thinking about our complicity and thinking about the ways that we we can refuse to to take part in in lots of those things that happen on a on a daily basis right and that goes for police stop and search as well that goes for when you see someone being arrested um not just taking it as okay well that must be a criminal all oh, the police must just be doing their job like we refuse doing to enable that and actually understand that everybody needs support everyone is experiencing an assault if they're being dragged into a police car right so that shouldn't be okay with us Last one to Zawa, if you have any points to add. Um, maybe something quick. You said in the everyday, um, there's so many things in the everyday that, that people do to refuse, and young people in particular is who I take inspiration from. Um, and um, yeah, the things that they want consent to, you know, so the way that, for example, they might protest against uniform codes, um, hair codes, um, music, language, the way that, that the way the young people speak as being police, particularly um, children and young people in particular backgrounds, right? Um, and uh, that really gives me inspiration. And um, I, I draw inspiration, for example, from also big acts of refusal, like what we saw with Pimlico Academy in 2021, yeah. and the protest that basically had four demands. They were protesting against discrimination, um, racism, Islamophobia and transphobia, poverty, and also, you know, specifically the cost of the uniform that they were being demanded to, to buy. And also their concerns around the culture of sexual assault and, and also the curriculum. They had really serious concerns about the curriculum that were being um, asked to follow at the, uh, at the academy. And so that's, th- those are acts of inspiration. Also, Coleridge Community College in Cambridge, where students have been told that silence is your natural state, mm. you know? young people being asked to walk around the school in silence. Um, and, um, and and they've, the young people that have petitioned um, against this draconian kind of discipline rules. Um, and, um, and also the parents have complained, like we haven't mentioned parents, but parents must uh, enact politics of refusal. They have powers, parents can be sacked. They can be banned from school site, but they can be sacked like teachers can. So we really need to think about um, what parents do in relation to the everyday refusal. Uh, and not just in relation to their own child, but like other children around them uh, and young people, maybe even the ones that they don't know uh, and will never know and um, mm. the ways in which they've been treated. And I'm also thinking about the way in which during last year's um, protest in, in, in Solidarity Palestine, so many teachers uh, that we know of were, were reprimanded, some were even fired. Mm-hmm. Um, some were really punished harshly for just showing solidarity to ch- the children that were protesting or wearing a badge. Um, and so the, the, um, the repression is really, really um, strong. And, and therefore our resistance has, has to be even stronger. Um, mm-hmm. Resisting policies, um, you know, and I think one of the ways in which we can do this, first of all, we, all of this requires courage. Yeah. Um, and, and a willingness to put ourselves in the way, but also, and I think really think that, I know that, that in this country there's a culture, I think I've seen um, in many spaces of like um, being conflict uh, averse, you know, they want to be 
part of any conflict. There's conflict, I want to be part of it. But um, if we're going to do social justice work, really, um, how are we going to do it without facing, um, you know, the injustices, uh, the, you know, like demands uh, have to be made and they, they want um, powers never ceded without forceful demands, right? So um, I think um, in the everyday, I think, People need to challenge policies and, and practices that are within their realm, within their neighborhoods, within their families, even the, our, and starts with our own transformation. Because as abolitionists and as, as teachers, as humans, as educators, as teachers, for sure, um, if we don't believe in the transformation of the self, then we might as well pack up, right? So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, a refusal to think that this is the best we can do. How can I do things differently as a parent, as a neighbor? Um, uh, as a sister, as a teacher, as an educator, as a as a school governor, whatever it is, and try and you know, try and dig deep for that courage, uh, and and sometimes sacrifices because some of these refusals come with a high price to be paid. So I don't want to paint like an overly romantic um, uh, picture of what refusal looks like. Yeah, because there's yeah. a cost to be paid. Yeah, yeah, and I think all of those points was what I was hoping that would have been said because refusal is to say that I am no longer going to be complacent in a system designed to kill me spiritually, mentally and physically. Um, in all of the ways you said in the everyday, it's it's how we help our neighbours, it's how we help our classmates, it's how we help our family. Um, it's what you said, Kelsey, being on a bus. You said this analogy months ago to me, being on a bus and you see something happen, what do you do? Um, and I think all of that is that and how we actively do it and how we're conscious. Um, there's a question from the audience that I would like to pose, um, is what role should authority have, if any, within teacher-student relationships in the abolitionist education context? Do let me know if you want me to repeat it. I can, I can um, try and answer this question. I think um, what abolition offers is a way for us to reimagine our social relations such that something like authority and the power conferred by authority would no longer exist. I think like when what I was saying in my, or attempting, I guess, to articulate in my intervention, um, was that there is a kind of like critical um, relationship between teachers and students that has an effect on students from their most kind of formative years. And if as abolitionists, we try to understand um, uh, abolition as a project that understands education as something reciprocal and active, then authority really plays no role. And that doesn't mean that there there isn't um, any sense of organisation or there isn't any sense that learning um, is will be disrupted or chaotic. I think the idea of chaos is something that um, really plagues the minds of people who are coming to abolitionist thinking because of this myth of order that is um, uh, kind of put forward by ideas of authority, by ideas of discipline. But what? But if we understand authority and discipline as actually modes of suppression, when we do that to children, we are saying um, we do not want you to express yourself in the fullness of your um, capacity. We are going to direct your learning, the way you exist in this space, what you do. Um, abolition offers another. Uh, an altern like an alternate vision that allows those students to have a say in how they engage not only with each other but with the process of learning and I think from my uh, earliest experiences of schooling children are often not seen as co-collaborators or co-producers of knowledge they're seen as kind of passive recipients of knowledge and if we want to put forward a transformative vision for what education is we have to take seriously that children also teach us things about being in the world. They teach us things about what education should and could look like. Um, and so if, I, I guess this question, maybe I'm misreading it, is getting at this idea of um, this anxiety about the lack of order 
you know, conferred in the, the lack of order that seems to be present in the abolitionist um, vision, which is why something like authority would be necessary. But I think when you transform the conditions in which people are learning, then authority would no longer be necessary because you wouldn't need to um, discipline people in order to get them to, um, you know, engage with you in a certain way. There could be a, a, a more genuinely collaborative way of engaging with students that that didn't require coercion i think i see authority as a form of coercion thank you so much i'll open the space to calcium though if you would like to input we have other questions but do you have any thoughts or insights Uh, that's completely fine. Um, other question I would love to ask is, um, is a question actually from the audience is, how do you see tackling punishment and carcerality in education more broadly in families beyond formal educational structures and institutions? I'm trying to give space for Zara to jump in, but I don't know. I think this one is for you, Kelsey. Yes. Yeah, so. Um. Yeah. So I guess for in terms of tackling punishment and carcerality, like in a more broad sense, it yeah, you're right. Like it can't just be done within the school, right? Because uh, just like anything, if you go home and your parents are like well that's not how we're doing it here then like yeah it creates that split and you're not going to be able to yeah we're not really transforming like the full conditions and so there's definitely a lot of work that I think needs to be done with parents with families but I think a fully abolitionist sort of approach is one that does look quite critically at the nuclear family right is one that looks at actually how do we bring uh care how do we bring health how do we bring learning into our collective structures as a community um, and play in a, play various roles um, that aren't so prescriptive as they are now within like something is to do you know the professionals and the the specific institutions that you have to yeah go to for all these things so I think a lot of the abolitionist work that we're doing is really trying to like think about how much unlearning has to be done um you know with the school that we're working with we are like primarily starting to work with the teachers because we understand that they're the ones that will be bringing that carcerality in and I think it's also important to be working with uh adults like, across the board to really reflect on the ways that the prison lives in our minds right um but yeah I think uh, yeah I don't know if I have like a specific answer other than the ways that we try to do public workshops we try to go into spaces that really encourage people to bring like yeah intergenerational sort of spaces that encourage people to bring a parent or bring a family member so that we can start to have these discussions about things like what our needs um, are what trust looks like all these kinds of things but having those conversations with people who are actually already in our lives not like just in leftist spaces or just within the workplace um, and so for me, it, it's really about trying to start to break down so much of that, which which is definitely hard. And I will say one of the biggest challenges, I think, is that uh, so within an institution, we might be able to build processes or we might be able to build like, yeah, more trusting relationships with young people that are more collaborative so that we can like speak about harms that we're experiencing. Unfortunately, like within the family, that's still one of the hardest places to name harm. Um, or at least that's what it seems to be from like the work that I've done is like actually a young person can basically be like shouting in your face about actually this is what's happened to me this is where it happened this is who it happened with and families will be like well I'm just not sure you know and so we'll come up with lots of justifications as to why we don't quite believe it or why we can have to put off like addressing it 
And that can be because it involves other family members who might hold a lot of power, or it might be something that we just like don't want to face about the fact that our young people might have gone through something like that under while under our care, right? And so uh, one of the biggest kind of challenges that I think we face at the moment is like really breaking down those barriers within families where we really talk about violence. We talk about how violence happens. We talk about it as something that could happen here, not something that happens over there um, by some monsters, you know? Um, And that is something that I think we have to start doing with our loved ones. So that's something that we can all start doing now, right? Is over time, like building, building those relationships where we actually build that understanding together about our histories and our responsibility towards each other. I would just um, add on to that as you were talking, Kelsey. I was I was thinking about um, this point also about decentering the university and the like formal education systems as the kind of primary site of learning. And what would it, I, I was thinking also about the history of like black supplementary schools um, in the UK and informal educational kind of spaces and and the conditions that allowed them to exist. Um, And I think what a decade of austerity has done is really decimated our social infrastructure such that it's near impossible now to kind of commandeer a community space or center where you could hold um, informal uh, political education sessions or any kind of um, learning processes outside of um, uh, formal educational structures. And so I, I really want to hammer home also that in in part of, you know, this idea that abolition is um, presence, not absence, it's also about thinking, how do we build enough power to get us back to a condition where we can, we can have space, time and energy in order to um, be able to I guess, create educational spaces where we can make those critical interventions if we can't make them um, through the uh, formal educational route. And that that in times of crisis, that has looked like not just community centres, it has looked like bookshops, it has looked like school, um, uh, it has looked uh, like community garden parties, you know, um, ways that uh, are dinners that are put on by um, specific kind of grassroots organizations. Those have all been also spaces of learning. Um, and so I think one of the kind of like, I guess to, to round up that the major thing is to not assume that the formal educational route is the only place our children are learning um, about what it means to be in the world they're constantly learning Um, and that makes education into a much more I guess dynamic and flexible um, experience for people Mm. and I think you said something really important and it just reminded me of um, Forefront, which is also a grassroots organization. And what we do is we, we do political education over food. Um, we order pizza and we sit around the table and it's knowing where to do it, who does it, the right moment, and thinking about political education and making language accessible. So it doesn't, ha- as you said, it doesn't have to be in these formal routes. It's saying that we're all in a space um, and looking at how we do it. I think it's crucial and it's happening um, across the UK, across the US, and also internationally. Um, I'll pass on to Zara if you would like to contribute or add anything. I think it's all been said really on this uh, point. Maybe we can see what other questions maybe are there? Uh, there more people? Yeah, um, there's a question which Kanda um, perfectly um kind of connects to the last question which is um would love to hear more about alternative spaces for education beyond the formal school system that has been experimented with particularly in how we make those as widely express accessible as they need i think that has been been said um so that was the question if no one wants to add any points i do have one question um it's quite a simple question um but i think this could help other people in exploring their own political activism is why do we continue why do we continue to do um the work why do we continue to resist why do we continue to create um this could be in your own um organizing this could be in a sense of collective um in a world where we are constantly desensitized in a world where we're constantly seeing violence and harm. Um, why? Why do we do it? Why do we create? 
Um, I think for me, like, this is where the kind of centrality of the political imagination is uh, very central. The, the centrality of the uh, political imagination becomes incredibly, like, obvious to me. Um, and it, to give a simple answer to your question, I guess we resist because we understand that... Um, we that, that that more is possible that we deserve more and that we could collectively kind of build more but also i think that if we refuse to to understand politics or um the kind of project of liberation as something that we win or lose if we understand kind of agitation as lifelong if we understand that there are critical interventions that we can make in um the spaces that we occupy then we get to and then um, we can build, I think, an environment where we understand um, that we needn't see the the results of the things that we demand in our lifetime. You know, we begin the, the project and somebody else um, picks it up. We belong to a kind of history um, of people who have looked around and enacted a specific kind of refusal that have um, that have said that, you know, the uh, that have I guess looked beyond the given and have um, really imagined what a dignified existence for themselves and others um, looks like, and that for me has a lot to do with like um, revolu the the concept or the idea of revolutionary love. And I I think it was Joy James that says something like, "My capacity to love is my capacity to fight," and that's something that I think about in terms of how we continue to fortify our political commitments to one another. Um, I think w for me, what drives a lot of this um, work is understanding that when I engage in um, any form of political action, I am shoring up my own um, political commitments and desires, but I'm also changing something on an interpersonal and relational level. I'm introducing the possibility that transformative gender relations could exist, or that an alternative um, way of looking at the world and society and education um, could exist, or that we could see the end of capitalism. Those are all, um, they're not just kind of abstract utopian visions and dreams. I think um, in we can use the political imagination to kind of sustain um, the projects that we're doing by recognizing that this work is never finished, that the question of politics and the question of our collective future is an ongoing one. And I think some people, you know, see that as kind of depressing. But for me, I see it as understanding what my role and my place is in a history and in a legacy. Um, yeah, and, and that also means, I guess, like understanding that the past, present and future are not distinct things. We we rehearse the futures that we um, want. We usher them in when we act in ways that defy um you know, the modes of um, social organization that are pressed upon us by governing structures, I think. Pass on to you, Kelsey. Yeah, that was so beautiful, Lola. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I just really echo that. For me, it is like knowing that I'm part of a legacy um, is like, motivational in this way that is like yeah it just like kind of gives purpose to what can be like a lot of overwhelming things and I feel like once you learn about what's going on in the world or you start to analyze your experiences in a certain way it's quite hard to go back I think and uh, um, yeah and so it's something to to yeah to kind of be like you know what like even though this is hard even though it's frustrating it is also hopeful because everything that I am living now is the result of the everything that's good now is the result of like that legacy of struggle that's that's happened right and things that are happening that is still to do with our oppression that is still enforcing these these oppressive structures that is like those same structures that existed to oppress my ancestors right and so it's like how we just like continue to fight I think is is just important to me and um and then recently I guess like I felt very affirmed in sort of like in in these beliefs and in this like way of trying to like live my life I guess because 
Um, I've started being able to be in a position to like step up for members of my family in ways that even if they're not fully sold on the idea of abolition, even if they're not fully like um, on board with all the politics of it, I think it just really is so striking that it's like, well, who is it that is able to like make the time to do this and able to like hear you about these problems and able to support you in these ways? It's 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 not like a separate thing. It's like because I believe all of these things, that I've also developed all of these skills in order to be in better relationship within my community as well. And so it's uh yeah it's something about being able to like live that future and start to see healing even within myself and my own family as a result of being really committed to this politic really committed to uh this vision and so by having those principles it also yeah it's just meant that there's been some really important and like quite magical shifts that I've been experiencing like quite recently that yeah like really affirms that this is this is the right thing to be doing do you know what I mean and so um yeah I feel I feel motivated and sort of that's why that's why I carry on I think thank you so much I'll pass on to Zava thank you it's, uh, it's really uh nourishing to the soul to listen to Lola and Kelsey and you Sarah as well talk about these things and I can see comments in the chat um, from friends uh, um, saying the policymakers should be a regular part of this conversation um, and I couldn't agree more um, and the trouble is that um, they're so far removed you know uh, policy is so disconnected with the reality that children and young people particularly those at the margins uh, live um, and that's definitely part of the mission. And I guess that's one of the drivers my, that gives me purpose to try and bring those spaces, those agendas together, closer together. I suppose that's why I'm also a re researcher. Um, I heard someone say that um, re research is about making the familiar strange. And I really like that. And so it's one of the things that gives me a uh, purpose to continue on because there are too many things that we have normalized and come to accept um, and, and, and stop questioning, uh, um, you know, on some, on some levels. Um, and I, I feel that, that that is what needs changing. Um, and also being part of a long legacy, like Sarah, you and I talk about it all the time about being a, you know part of this legacy of like black women who've been in 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 the struggle for education for a long time in, on multiple lands um so and not just in education so it's um it's part of who we are and also um yeah this i i almost can't see like any other way of being uh the the, the responsibility of being a mother of being a, a, a human being, an educator. These are privileges as well as responsibilities. And so, um, and once, as you said earlier, you know, um, Kelsey, once you see, you can't unsee things. Mm. So, thank you so much. Oh, my soul just was touched um, with all of the remarks. Um, and yeah, I'm speechless because it's, it's reminding each other that we do this work for each other. Um, for our survival. Um, I'm reminded by Audrey Lord's word, uh, words that like revolution isn't a one-time act. Um, is Our revolution is every day. Um, and that's how I keep going, is to say the work we do, um, we might never see the fruits, but I will see the fruits of community. I'll see the fruits of community gathering together. Um, and what is the fruits? I can go into a whole set, another political education talk on that. But that is important to say like, we're holding each other. Um, through through these violent systems and we have to do the work because if we don't then then we die in so many different ways so um, I want to thank you for your beautiful words um, we are wrapping up very very soon and I'm looking at the time so I'll give space for you to close like any closing remarks that you would like to say before I wrap up um, it's fine if you don't but I'll give you space for any closing remarks I think um, I would just like to underline um, the point that 
I guess when we talk about abolition or we talk about being abolitionists, um, the children that become kind of like fodder for this debate know what's happening to them. It's not that like, you know, they're unaware that they're being subjected to forms of discipline or forms of violence that um, make their life more difficult and, and you know, um, inflict on them a specific kind of misery. I think it's important to understand them as co-collaborators in the vision for education um, and not to become so removed, I think, when we talk about um, schooling in a kind of abstract way, in a way that that focuses on teachers or governors or parents. Um, uh, I think that that children, yeah, they can clarify a lot for us and they their stake in this is um, huge. And that's something that we need to honour, I think, in in any kind of attempt at a collaborative vision. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. It's been such a, an honour. Thank you to Haymarket and um, Hajar and um, all of the work that NME does as well. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. Zawa, Kelsey, any last words? I can just say, um, Really quickly, I want to echo the thank yous, Haja and Haymarket, everyone's listening, Kelsey, Lola for making time, Sarah, for curating this so beautifully with such love and care, radical love and care. We're so grateful and so grateful to have you within NME and connected to NME. Um, I would just finish off by saying that, um, um, to pick up from where Lola just left, that in education uh, discourse, uh, and conversations and spaces, children and young people are notably absent. You know, they're not there. And um, and it, I, I just, it, and that includes this conversation actually. I know that might be some on the chat. And so we have to be committed to putting that right, to making sure that children and young people are at the heart of every conversation. Also because children and young people do not remain children and young people forever. Um, they grow up, uh, you know, to, to, to be community members, neighbor, neighbors, aunties, parents, step parents, all of that. So it's really important. And the second point as well is that um, I really want to see a reclaiming of education. That's, that's where the title came from as well, the freeing of education, that it's, it's really in a cage, uh, in a carceral cage. And um, we won't be able to do that without, without children and young people in, involvement. So. Yeah, those are my final remarks. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have much to add. Um, I think, yeah, this has been such a wonderful discussion. It's really great to hear all of you speak. And thank you everyone for the questions and for watching on YouTube. Um, I, yeah, I, I think, I guess I want to, I always want to like end these things with kind of some reassurance, I guess, of like, if you're new to abolition, like, these things are challenging, they are like big things to think about and I think Lola's point about like the sort of the worry about chaos is is so true and I guess I just want to like reiterate that like a like things are not as like calm and orderly as as uh, you know they might seem to be um, but also the this work is about like trying to do something right it is like rather than just going for this thing which is punishment where we, which we know doesn't work like there has been no like evidence if that's what you're into of like that actually working to to make children change the way they behave or anything and so if that's already not working like what do we have to lose by trying something else right like trying other options getting creative and just listening to what young people need. Um, I think like so many of us grew up not being listened to, that it's actually quite hard to actually even envision a world where young people are listened to. And we're often so busy like playing out our own cycles of trauma onto young people that it closes our kind of imaginations to actually how we could behave differently. And it is challenging and it does take time and we will fail a lot on the way, but those are each opportunities to keep learning every time we are advancing like our experiences and our understanding and our knowledge of how to build these structures and, and to do things differently. And so 
um, I really think we should just keep trying, basically. Um, and I know there was a question in the chat also about unschooling, and I just want to shout out the book by Akila S. Richards, um, which speaks about unschooling. And yeah, absolutely, like, abolish schools. A big part of that already is that some people are just taking their kids out of school, um, and people have been doing that forever, but there's also like a conscious sort of unschooling thing happening. I think we have a lot that we can learn from young people who have been through that process um, and parents who have supported them through that process. Um, and yeah, I think like the more we can learn about alternatives and ways that we, like people are trying to do stuff outside of these systems, the more we'll have an imagination for understanding like actually, yeah, we do learn by you know, traveling or by like experiencing things or like speaking to people and engaging with people. Those are all things that we can learn as well. And a lot of it happens outside of those school institutions. Anyway, now we'll end. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been really great. No, thank you, um, Lola, Kelsey, Zava, everyone watching, Haymarket, Hadra Press, um, for just sharing all of the knowledge, your work, your wisdom and reminding everyone that the work is happening. Um, people are building on, on our ancestors, our elders, um, and we'll continue to do the work of the right, racial capitalism is dismantled. Um, and that is the purpose. I do want to remind everyone before we leave that this is the first of a free session, political, edu political education session. Um, we'll be having one in September as No More Exclusion takes a break in August, as rest is also a part of our movement. Um, so please, look at our social medias in September, uh, sign up, join us with just redistributing knowledge and community and love and healing and everything that goes with it. Um, so yeah, thank you so much everyone. And I'm looking forward to having this conversation again in September. Right.